Okay. So welcome uh, to this presentation on, uh, go to the first slide, to uh, a view of the future of computing. I'm Markus Schulz. I work in the IT department at CERN. And uh, if you have questions, please, at the end of the, the presentation. So let's get started. Brilliant. So predictions are quite risky. As you can see, if you look at the predictions of a few famous people, there's Thomas J. Watson in 43 saying, I think there's a world market of maybe five computers, slightly off. There's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. And look at the year, 1977, the founder of digital equipment, the company that brought us a fabulous Vexus. Then, should come the next one. There's no chance that the iPhone is going to get any significant market share. 2007, Steve Ballmer. Then comes the next one. There's no money to be made with the World Wide Web. That was actually me in 95. <laughs> <laughs> and I continue to work on physics and not uh, start an enterprise. And here I am. So, no, it doesn't work. You might wonder, why it is so difficult. So maybe smart people, uh, physicists, are better at all this. Um, the high energy physics community had to predict the computing and storage needs for the LHC. So we took a lot of care and effort to do this. We based it on technology trends, the needs that the experiments expressed to us, budget assumptions, which actually was the only thing that always kept, uh, stayed uh, more or less constant through the process. So we measured our expectations uh, in units of 10 to the 7 MIPS. Don't worry about it. It's just how much a computer can do. And I have put it all normalized to the units. So in 1996, we thought we would need one of these units. This would be good for the first year running uh, LHC. 2001, we did a little bit more research. And we thought seven. Seven of these enormous uh, uh, amount of computing would be good. 2006, we got. We thought, mm, we have overlooked a few things. 55 would be needed. In 2009, 10, just one year before we started really taking the last, uh, first full harvest, 61. But that's, that's it. If you compare what we had at the time installed at, at CERN in the same units, when we made the first uh, uh, estimate, we had 0 0.005 of these units. So one looked to us like it's a really, really big number. So this continued. 2006, we were already in the kind of same game almost. 2009, we were really getting ready. And with 20, we thought, safe side. So this is what we used. So 300 units. Just remember, just two years later. Provided and used by the WHCG that has been just uh, uh, described before. So you wonder, should we just take our crystal ball and get rid of it? Um, I will try to explain why this is not so stupid, nevertheless. Just uh, observations that look like random observations. A five euro music birthday card that can play an MP3 has more computing power in it uh, than the complete, the combined Allied forces during World War II. So, and you dispose it. They would have killed for this. A 2013 smartphone is faster than CERN's computing center from the mid-90s. So this huge room full of nice, expensive equipment you're carrying in, our, in your pocket, some of you at least. So if intuition breaks down, this is the lesson that the physicists should have learned when they face quantum physics. Take a structured, more numerical approach and believe the equations and go on. So how do you build a crystal ball? You look at what determines the future of computing. There are a few things. Physics. You cannot break the laws of physics. You have to stay in a kind of, of realm that is, uh, uh, is with, uh, respects physics. Technology. Technology is needed to build computers. Markets drive technology, so you have to look at them. And then you have every couple of years, you have a paradigm shift, which means suddenly everything you believed before is no longer true. Something else is true, and something else is important, and you cannot refer to what has been there before. So how good can we predict these things? The laws of physics that will be affecting what can be done in computing up to the next 30 years or so are well 
understood. The technology, because it is a bit more tricky because costs go in there, five to seven years we know what this will bring. The markets, it's a much more complicated thing. As we have seen with the, with the rise of the smartphones, something that has been not there suddenly is a large fraction of the silicon industry, of the computer industry. And of course, paradigm shifts you cannot predict because otherwise it would not be paradigm shifts. So these can hit you over the head any moment. This is why it is difficult to make a crystal ball. In addition, all these things are linked. So the physics laws dictate what technology can do. Paradigms and physics work together. You have to be in line with physics, but sometimes paradigm shifts open new doors. They in all influence markets and costs. And this all is, is a dynamic system, so it's very difficult to predict. So everyone knows that uh, computers are built out of certain building blocks, like the central processing units for processing, memory for storing, storage for keeping stuff, networks for moving stuff around. To get a faster overall system, all need to improve. I cannot cover the developments in each of these areas in these 25 minutes, so I will focus a bit on CPUs, and just trust me, all other systems evolve following similar patterns with different rates. So understanding one is helping understand the other. So over the last 50 years or so, the so-called Moore's law, which is better called Moore's observation, has been dri uh, driving the prediction business. He said somewhere in the 70s that transistor density on integrated circuits doubles about every two years. So what does this mean? It means you can get twice as many logical components to build your computers with at even higher speed for the same price, or you choose not to go faster but use less power. And this you get every two years. So, sounds not so bad. Every two years double, okay, can deal with that. So, to get a feel for this, you have to look at what it would mean if Moore's law would not work. If a transistor today would be as big as in 1959, when the first planar transistors, with roughly the same technology that we build transistors today, was built. And it was, had the size of one square millimeter. So if you look at this, this should represent one square millimeter. In the 60s, we had 16 transistors on a die. In the 70s, when the first uh, home computers came up, like the Ataris and uh, the Commodores and the first Apple IIs, 4,500 transistors made you a nice 8-bit processor, and that would be already quite a, big, a bit of a surface. So in 85, um, Intel released um, a, pro a processor for the home market, which had for the first time the capabilities of a real computer, as we would say. It had 275,000 transistors on it, and it roughly would be, with these, without the scaling law, the size of a Sunday newspaper open. So from there we go on, of course. Processors improve, 95, five and a half million. You would need a bathroom to store the CPU. You have to make decisions in life. In the 2000s, we uh, had the, the first high-performance com uh, microprocessors with 200 million uh, uh, transistors. That would mean roughly this room and a bit, maybe up to the red couch out there. So what we have now is uh, the top CPUs that are built, multi-core processors, have 3 billion transistors. And this is an Olympic-sized swimming pool, actually the one in Munich. And you need two of those plus a bit. If that shows you all this, if you would use, a, based on the technology known in 59, is now crammed in, in something of the size of my thumbnail. So, and it's understandable that this is extremely difficult for people to understand. So to get a feel for this, you can't actually. So in parallel, the frequencies, the speed with which things are done in a, in a, in a computer also increased. Smaller structures, mean you have a smaller number of electrons to push through smaller gaps so you can go faster. From 1917 to 1990, it followed all completely uh, as expected as a law. You got a 50 times increase in speed. And then it got interesting. What you see here is ignore the logarithmic scale. 
what you see here is, in the red line, until 2002, business as usual. And then suddenly something happened that we have never seen anywhere in the, uh, in the electronic industry. Things stopped to improve. Actually, they declined a little bit on average. And it's leveling out now the, the speed of uh, at something like 3 to 4 gigahertz. Interesting that this side is cut. Okay. So why is this? This is not because we couldn't make them far and faster, but it's people try to reduce the energy consumption of ships, try to get easier heat management, and also there is something that is already kind of what I call Heisenberg's flag showing up. Quantum physics is not yet hitting you, but the size of the, the components that you build is varying a little bit when you build them. And that means you can run a computer ship only as fast as the slowest transistor on it can run. And that means you have to take a safety margin uh, compared to what you could theoretically do with, uh, with a process. So it's leveling up in the frequency. So what is the future of the law? So the current structures are 22 nanometers, which is not a structure humans usually deal with, but you probably have a kind of feel how thick your hair is. This is an electron microscopic uh, picture of a hair, and it's about 100 micrometers wide. And with the current technology, along the line across a hair, you get 4,500 transistors, which happens to be exactly the number of transistors in the CPU of the very, very popular computer from the 80s. So it fits now on the width of your hair. So Intel's roadmap, and I choose Intel because it's really the technology driver when it comes to putting it into action. For 2014, they say 40 nanometers. 10 nanometers in 2016, and in 2022, they reach 3 nanometers. They hope, or they believe, they have this in the laboratory all done. This has to be uh, um, taken with a grain of salt. Already at 22 nanometers, you see the first quantum mechanical effects. And what this means is, you are not so sure anymore where your electrons are. Are they at this side of the barrier, on the other side, in somewhere in the middle, or are they in the wire, outside the wire, up, down, everything? And these effects get stronger and stronger the smaller you get, the more you go to the size of an atom. So the smallest transistor that has been built in the laboratory, not selected from chemical processes that build transistors, but really placed at a place, is 1.5 nanometers using a single atom as a gate. So that is the benchmark. And you can't go with half an atom. So what do you do, actually, with 3 billion transistors? It's a good question. So two core concepts have been used to speed up computer architecture over the time we have computers. The one is called pipelining, working like an assembly line. So you push something in, you do little things on this. And you see a Ford Motor Works uh, assembly line, and you get the idea. You have, you have people doing very little things on it, and when the whole assembly line is ticking away, you get a completed car at the speed one person can do one little thing. Same for computers. The other technology it's used is parallel processing. It's working concurrently and communicating a little bit with each other. Here you see uh, um, people working on sewing machines, and they all work in a huge room, but everyone does the whole piece for themselves. But nevertheless, the total output of that room is, of course, roughly n times the sewing machines that are operated. So many additional very complex and smart tricks have been invented to keep this even get working better, like caching, branch prediction. There are many, many tricks, and you can study years of your life uh, how they work. Nowadays, CPUs use all these tricks combined. They make different emphasis on different things, but they use it all. And what does it mean? It means at the end, actually, that it's very difficult to make full use of the hardware. Different problems perform differently well, and the average program performs actually quite badly. It uses about 5 to 10% of the gates on a modern CPU. So it's the software that's the problem. And sometimes you face fundamental limits they, the, which are described in Amdahl's law, which basically says if you do something in parallel and you have to come to back and bring things together, only the slowest element defines the overall speed. So it's not the hardware that's holding us back. So some people might say, yeah, but supercomputers. 
I read every time top 500, get better and better. What are these things? Why don't we use them as, as normal computers? So current supercomputers are built from the exactly same components that we use in servers and also in desktops. They use a bit more, like the TNA2 has now 3,120,000 cores, so a large number of CPU cores. You add a high-speed network to it, you add some graphics cards that are slightly modified, and off you go. And what you get is, you see on the right, you get a huge room full of stuff, poorly designed from the visual impact, not like the bespoke technology we were using in the 80s as supercomputers from Cray, where you could even select the color of the seat cushions. So I miss that time. So what alternative technologies? Why not go completely different, forget the silicon? People try this. They try really hard. You see a, a lot of things that are, are looked at, single uh, molecule transistors and glass plates with enormous amounts of storage. The only thing that has reached up to now really mass scale production is the first attempts to use 3D structures, but not to get more density, but to handle these little quantum mechanical effects already. Now, it's very difficult to see what will win out of this as a next big thing, but uh, uh, they all are in the 1 2,000 components level. Laser nanostructures in glass are a little better. They can already produce working disks. There has been attempts, uh, proof of concept, to do uh, DNA storage, where you encode into DNA that you build up data. And the storage density that they achieved is at one cubic centimeter gives you 1,000 terabyte. That means half a German shot glass where you drink whiskey from can hold one year of LHC data. It's pretty good for a small glass. But it's very, 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 very expensive and very, 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 very slow. So it's more a kind of proof of, of principle. Some other thing that is coming up more and more and becoming interesting is quantum computing. And you see the first commercial quantum ship on the right side. There are two main branches. One of them is using a phenomenon of uh, quantum state superposition and entanglement to form qubits. This, of course, if you are not a physicist, sounds to you like, wow, 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 qubits. And what it means is you use the strange laws of quantum mechanics that the cat can be alive and dead and other things and work with this. It has the potential to revolutionize computing. No, none of the current encryption systems that are widely used would be safe if this works at scale. The systems, however, have to be kept in a very, very careful state because it's a very delicate state and any disruption can make it break. It's very, very early stages, stages very experimental. Many passes are followed in parallel. And the successes are the current systems can tell you which numbers you have to multiply to get 142 or something. So some factorization of numbers on that small level. But it is, from the principles behind, they're very promising. D-Wave Systems, on the other hand, is a commercial provider. They have a more pragmatic approach. They look at physical processes that are interesting and that could be used to do practical work. And they have a quantum annealing ship where you can solve optimization problems. And it's not surprising who bought it. Google, because they buy anything that looks like the next wave of technology, because they understand if they miss the next paradigm, they are dead. And Lockheed, because they have a lot of optimization problems that is paid by the government and the military, so cost doesn't matter. So it's interesting, and it will stay with us, but it's not a general purpose computer. So to see the close link between market and technology and how they drive each other, you can see if you look at the Bitcoin currency. It's a, I don't explain how it works because it takes a day or so. Think of a virtual currency that is strongly depends on cryptography and where the people by doing things create it itself. This creating of these, these Bitcoins is called mining. And you basically execute a computer, uh, an algorithm on your computer. And the more Bitcoins are around, the algorithm gets harder and harder. So this is to stop inflation in a way. So 
it boils down to computing power equals money. So what did people do? They did all kinds of things to get that money. You see a room full of computers. You see something that you unfortunately can't see completely, which is a custom ship on a USB uh, a stick. So they started with desktops, first using their own ones, and then realized that the power consumption is not worth the effort. So they stole other people's computers to do bit mining, the so-called botnets. Then they recognized that uh, video cards can do this much better. They used first their own. Then they started to hack into servers and use it. In 2011, this ended. People realized that using computer chips that you can reconfigure for special algorithms can do the trick. And in 2013, just a few years after the concept was born, money had driven people to put the same effort in as developing a new CPU. They built custom ASICs that you can now buy for a lot of money that outperform everything on the world that is in for this one algorithm. So the market drives technology. And who ignores that will go wrong in the predictions. So there's another law uh, that Moore uh, came up with that's now called Rock's Law. And this is that cost of a semiconductor ship fabrication plant doubles every four years. Sounds benign because you get twice as much out of it. The cost of the next generation fabrication plants that are now built is per fabrication plant $5 billion. You have to put that on the table before the first ship comes out. And you need more than one. Intel builds three right now. You have to have this money in your hand to do this. This means very few companies will survive. Higher prices, less research. So total dominance of the market by a very small number of, uh, of, of companies. The consumers move away from anything that is relevant for, for improve the performance of computing. This, this is a part of the market that is performance oriented. And all the rest is mobile devices and end-user devices where the money is. You go for this. You don't go for this. So, so what does it mean? Consumers move to these lightweight devices. They put the long-term and complicated things into cloud services that other people run for them. That also means that server machines in these clouds are better utilized, less demand for them. And Everything depends on a network. The producers follow this. They go for the price point. They integrate more and more stuff, and at the end, build slower CPUs. So the price for servers, however, is less critical. So they can demand high prices, because the total cost of these cloud providers is in electricity, the buildings, and the people. So it doesn't look good for high performance computing. So putting it now all together, and now I take the, the leap of faith and the risk, and what I came up with, what will happen. In five to 10 years, Moore's law will continue. It will be harder and harder. You will see more diverse and complex solutions that can gain an edge, like with the bitcoins. The first quantum computers will do real work, not only play. Computers will change completely shape. The concept that you have a computer in your office or something like that will go away. You will have portable, foldable, rollable, wearable, integrated into anything devices, especially up to the end. And the network access at high bandwidth from everywhere will be fairly standard. These things that people have overlooked for a while, and you see it in your cars, assistance systems will drive computing a lot. Driving will be, at the end of 10 years, not fully automated, but there will be so much assistance systems that they warn you that they have sort of intelligence. At the work, data mining, decision making will be helped. Augmented reality like Google Glass is just the tip of the iceberg. Translation services. And also we will see the first integration between humans and computer systems. Not cyborgs. What we will see is handicapped people that have implants in their brain that go to fairly smart electronics that then help them move around or see or something equivalent to it. There will be a slight slowdown of progress. The software has to catch up with where the hardware is. So five years, nothing special, just uh, Moore's Law. 10 years, also still Moore's Law. 100 times the performance from now at the same cost. So nothing to write home about. 20 years, this is a time we, we reach the critical phase. 
In 20 years, we definitely are at the system, at the system size of single atoms. So all computing has to be on the molecular level. Moore's law will stop there, because integrating things further is not, has no meaningful meaning. So the high-end systems at this time will reach the complexity of the human brain. Not the intelligence, because that would mean that you do something with it, but they have enough things that are connected with each other to, to be there. Current supercomputer systems are on a 2% level. The first world will store everyone's DNA and process it for medical reasons. Quantum computers or biology-inspired systems will be there in 20 years. They all will some way deal with quantum effects. For research and large-scale services, medical applications, like custom-designed uh, uh, drugs. And the end-user devices will not be perceived as computers anymore. People will have not the concept that they are computers. They will get information, they will share information. Network interruptions in major metropolitan areas will uh, be treated like, like any disaster nowadays, like no electricity or something like that. And many people will start use direct connection to their brains voluntarily to enhance sensory and intellectual capabilities. People do this in a way already. A lot of people become very unproductive if they don't have their smartphone with them that they are connected to all the time. I'm not saying whether this is good or bad. I just say this is quite likely to happen. 20 years from now, 5,000 times higher than uh, 2013 at the same cost, roughly. So it means you take basically half of CERN's computer center and will be able to buy it for a week's pay. So it's not so bad. 50 years, haha, <laughs> I will be dead. <laughs> and the younger people can check whether I was right. Naive explanation, uh, extrapolation from now is uh, something like 33 million times fold improvement. Um, I said naive, but it happened before if you look at what happened since, uh, since the 50s. So uh, it's unimaginable that this would happen all the time, but it has happened. So this is why I'm very careful. So, however, information processing will be fighting the hard limits that fundamental physics laws set you. So you cannot have uh, infinite amount of energy in a, a certain space. You cannot uh, uh, do things faster than the speed of light. That means the systems have to be relatively compact. So you will, we will spend a lot of time fighting with this, or better, you will spend. So I can see two scenarios. One is uh, the one that is a little bit like the, the, what happened to cars. The digital age continues. Um, you get cars that work somehow, and then you start gradual improvements, but nothing dramatic over a period of uh, 30 years. I know that the car industry is, thinks different about that, but if you compare a 1983 Golf, which looked like that, you would say it's a car, isn't it? With the latest Golf, you would say it's a car. And you can even classify it as the same thing. Or we will have a paradigm shift. And if you get a paradigm shift, magic will happen, like with every paradigm shift. You cannot compare it to anything before. And if I could predict it, no one would believe it, including me. You probably better link up with sci-fi authors to get an idea about that. So that's all. Thanks a lot. And enjoy the next paradigm shift. Well, when I was a young man, artificial intelligence was, uh, you could go and have lectures at the university about it, and it promised all kinds of things, and it made all kinds of weird statements like, if ever a computer beats a world-class chess player, it has to be an intelligent machine. <clears throat> Time gone by, the machine has not been intelligent. Uh, understanding and having a conversation with a computer is a, a Turing test. Oh, yeah, this will be very difficult. And, and now you have systems that not claim to be intelligent systems, like Siri, where you not can have a meaningful discussion, but you can exchange things with. I think the concept of artificial intelligence is a bit academic. This will just happen in a way. So systems, we will not call it, call it intelligence. Systems will become more and more integrated in the interaction with us. 
and we will make them more and more useful for us. And uh, yeah, they will, the word intelligence will not come in there. Because even for humans, it's a fairly crap concept. You know, I, for example, have an IQ of 105. I'm borderline normal. But I cope quite well in this environment. So this, this concept of intelligence, um, I think people will work on something that in retrospect they will say, oh, this is artificial intelligence now. But they will not work consciously on it. I'm more uh, convinced that systems like large query and data processing uh, uh, activities like Google does them will lead to the emergence of something that we will perceive later as, as intelligence. So I would say more human-like in the interaction and in the problem-solving abilities. And this, I'm pretty sure, will gradually come. It will not be a bare step function. It's already coming gradually if you look at the system. So, not satisfied. <laughs> so, maybe another question then. So I actually uh, um, have a good understanding of where the software has to go now. And it's uh, um, unfortunately backward in a way. So for many uh, years, and I've also been teaching applied uh, computing, uh, we have told generations of students, don't look at what the machine would do. Build a good, well understood logical system Use object-oriented uh, uh, paradigms. Make it easy to understand. Reuse code as much you can, and, 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 and. And we see exactly the small usage of the, the underlying uh, hardware is partially due to that. You know, this, this is, uh, uh, people have to go a little bit back for the core algorithms and become extremely aware again what the machine is doing if you want it to do this which is, uh, in a way, unfortunate. And it will be really difficult to manage the complexity, because object-oriented programming has helped a lot to manage the complexity of the, the systems. But this is, um, unfortunately, something we cannot afford anymore, <laughs> which, in a way, is for the young people probably interesting, because thinking about, if I write the code in this order, what will happen? Of course, the compilers are getting smarter. But against the level of indirection that object-oriented programming has given us, the compilers are basically, they cannot do anything for you in that. So the software, when I say it needs to catch up, means we, we need really new concepts, how we get, on one hand, the software written in a way that it can make use of your, uh, of, of your hardware, completely new algorithms sometimes, and it's the same, manage the complexity. And we are far from having mastered that. So I see we run out of time. You can talk to me outside if you want. <laughs>